Welcome to the sixth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2020. I can ask everyone in the room to ensure that mobile phones are on silent and that mobile devices are not used for photography or recording proceedings. The first item on our agenda is our final evidence session as part of the Committee's inquiry into the supply and demand for medicines. Uh, and we will uh, take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary, who is uh, here with us this morning. So welcome uh, this morning to Dean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, who is accompanied by Rosemary Parr, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, Alison Strath, Principal Pharmaceutical Officer, Brian Lamb, Head of Pharmacy Branch, and Alpana Mayor, Head of Effective Prescribing and uh, Therapeutics. Welcome. Uh, I I think it's important to acknowledge at the beginning of this meeting that uh, everyone's time is perhaps tight in this uh, difficult, the difficult circumstances uh, in which we are operating. So we will endeavour uh, to be as focused and uh, concise uh, as we can. And I'm sure uh, that uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will wish to take the same approach. But may I invite you to make an opening statement? Thank you very much, convener. Point, point taken. Um, and uh, before I start, I, I just want to personally convey the apologies of Dr. Gregor Smith, our Deputy Chief Medical Officer. I know that he has advised you of this, but he is this morning with the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, uh, as uh, I'm sure you appreciate. Uh, so my thanks to you and to the committee for inviting me here today to give evidence on your inquiry. I'm sure that over the course of four evidence sessions that you've held, you and colleagues will know that the supply and demand for medicines is diverse and complex in its nature and that real change requires a whole system approach from manufacturers, wholesalers, prescribers to the supply to an individual to how someone uses their medicine and finally how unused medicines are disposed of. Medicines, of course, prevent, treat or manage many illnesses and conditions, and they are the most common intervention in our healthcare system. So it is important that we get the most from medicines for both patients and the NHS. This is increasingly becoming more important as the health and social care sector treats and cares for more people in our society. People uh, in our society with an ageing population living longer with multiple long-term conditions. We do see more people with complex conditions being treated at home or in their communities with medicines historically used previously only in hospitals uh, because we know that these provide uh, and that care location provides the best outcomes for patients. Uh, in face of these challenges, the NHS in Scotland tries to ensure that we deliver the best value for money on the medicines purchased. NHS Scotland spent around £1.7 billion on medicines in 2018-19, the largest volume of medicines dispensed in the community, just over 103 million items at a cost of around £1.3 billion. And while the total number of items dispensed to patients has steadily increased over the last decade, we did see a fall of £6 million on the net cost of medicines from 2017-18. This is a welcome fall in the cost. It is a testament to the hard work of the health service, GPs and pharmacists in delivering effective prescribing for patients. The voluntary scheme for branded medicines pricing and access, VPAS, is one me uh, mechanism by which the UK government seeks to control the cost of branded medicines to the health service. The aim of the scheme is to ensure predictability and stability in both government and the pharmaceutical industry and to ensure the cost of branded medicines to the health service stays within affordable limits. It places a 2% cap on the growth in sales on branded medicines for each year of the scheme and phar pharmaceutical companies repay the NHS for any spending above this cap. The Scottish Medicines Consortium, which I know you will be very familiar with, also has a critical role to play in the, as a national source of independent advice on the clinical and cost effectiveness of all new medicines for the health service in Scotland. Uh, their work ensures that people have timely access to new medicines that provide most benefit based on the best available ed evidence. Community pharmacists undertake a key role in the procurement of medicines in primary care responding quickly to changes in the marketplace and driving down the prices being charged by wholesalers and manufacturers. 
But procuring medicines effectively is only one part of the jigsaw. Effective prescribing strategies ensure safe and effective prescribing and use of medicines. So it is important that we focus on the priorities of realistic medicines and the national clinical strategy in applying evidence-based prescribing in both primary and secondary care. Since 2012, we have had a policy in place on address addressing holistic prescribing through the polypharmacy guidance realistic prescribing. 11% of all hospital admissions are attributable to medication-related harm, and half of these are preventable. So the work reduces harm and waste and is integral to the review, uh, in, and integral to that review is a patient discussion on adherence. Until 2012-13, there was an annual volume increase of 3%. Since the introduction of the first polypharmacy guidance in 2012, the rate of volume increase has fallen each year. The introduction of pharmacotherapy service in around 70% of our general practices coming from the GP contract, phase one of that, means that we now have pharmacists and pharmacy technicians embedded in the general practice team providing medication management systems, including formulary compliance, hospital outpatient requests, medicine reconciliation, and repeat prescribing management. They also provide polypharmacy and medication reviews, including of high-risk medicines, and take on the management of people with more complex multiple conditions, where they are taking decisions with the individual on the use of their medication and monitoring and adjusting treatment prescriptions where appropriate. By taking on this role, these pharmacists are improving clinical outcomes for people, reducing the workload of GPs, uh, freeing capacity for others to focus on those with undifferentiated illness or other complex needs. The pharmacy profession as a whole has a key role in empowering people and their carers who support them to make best use of the services on offer. We are strengthening and refreshing the chronic medication service in order to improve how it enables community pharmacists to improve personalised care for people with stable long-term conditions. As experts in medicines and their use, pharmacists play a crucial role in supporting people to use their medicines to achieve the best clinical outcomes. The launch of our new NHS Pharmacy First Scotland service, which will be this April, will allow individuals to receive a consultation with a member of their pharmacy team and receive advice on treatment, including self-care for minor illnesses and self-limiting conditions, or referral to another healthcare professional, if appropriate. And we have to consider, alongside all of that, the impact of social prescribing in helping patients self-manage and achieve better health outcomes, either in place of or in conjunction with prescribed medicines. It's worth highlighting, finally, that not all prescribed medicines wastage is avoidable or the result of poor practice. We are more likely to improve health outcomes by focusing on better medicine use and improving adherence, as opposed to waste reduction on its own. Finally, uh, convener, we continue to focus on improving the quality of care and achieving better health health outcomes for the population, and in particular for people with multiple and complex long-term conditions. This requires improving pathways of care based on integrated multi multidisciplinary uh, teams, which is preventative, anticipative, and proactive in nature. And I personally look forward to the conclusion of your inquiry uh, to help us move further along that road. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That's much appreciated. Um, can I start by asking about one of the themes that comes up uh, in, has come up in this inquiry, as it has in others, and that is the collection of data and the use of technology in, in order to improve outcomes. <clears throat> I wonder if you could bring us up to date on the work that's being done uh, on the uh, digital platform and, uh, uh, in particular, on time skills for delivery and how that can help in terms of prescribing and dispensing of medicines. Yeah. Well, I, I will start with that, uh, convener, if I may, and then either of my two yep. colleagues here will follow through. Um, in terms of the hospital electronic, electronic, I'm having a real problem with my words this morning, hospital electronic prescribing and medicines, uh, the Hepner uh, programme, uh, we already have uh, four health boards, NHS, Ayrshire and Arran, Dumfries and Galloway, Forth Valley and Lanarkshire, 
uh, implementing or close to completing implementation of HEPMA. Uh, other boards, including NHS Lothian, who are partnering with the State Hospital, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, uh, and others are uh, working through their design and or their implementation. Uh, and I think our expectation is that the majority of boards will have concluded the implementation of HEPNA by the end of this year, uh, with perhaps only one or two of the smaller ones still to uh, complete that work. In terms of other uh, uh, work that includes the data collection as well as effective prescribing, um, I'll ask our Chief pharmaceutical officer to okay. Thank you, Convener. Uh, and just to add to that, the Cabinet Secretary is right, I think, to tell a, a good story around both the pace and traction of HEPMA being introduced across our secondary care services. And we will know, because I, I know you've heard lots of evidence around data and outcomes already, that this is one part of the jigsaw, particularly in secondary care, where we haven't got that such a light or illumination on prescribing and outcomes as we do in primary care. So I think HEPMA is absolutely important. Um, and I think there's something there for us to see how can we then improve on HEPMA to get to the stage where it's not just about a safe prescribing system, but also is then looking at aspects of what happens to patients when they take their medicines. So is it related to harm or benefit? And how can we measure that benefit? We're not alone uh, across the world in trying to have difficulty in measuring benefit for medicines, particularly where people are co-prescribed. Lots of medicines have lots of illnesses, but there is something there, that golden nugget, I think, to try and get to the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't think it's just about access to medicines or new medicines, but that healthcare intervention and the health outcome or gain is really important. So outcomes and data is definitely part of where we want to be. The Montgomery Review has pointed us out in di that direction. HEPMA absolutely will be part of that as well. Um, and maybe lastly on this part about outcomes and data. Scottish Government have also recently um, pump primed a, a CMOP programme, which I, I hopefully you've heard about, Cancer Outcomes Medicines Programme. And that's a really, again, I think a, a really positive start as to look to where we might be in the future. Yes, it only applies to cancer medicines just now, but what we're doing, looking at perhaps um, looking at aspects of what and how medicines are used in the real life, um, not just in clinical trials, not just in controlled conditions, I think would make a difference not just to cancer, but to other areas as well. So we, we're happy to see that being funded over the next few years. It's been looking at aspects of myeloma and prostate cancer and other areas, and the service will gain from that rollout, and then looking at other aspects of medicines as well. So I think just, just to finish that uh, life cycle of a medicine, not just access, but health gain and outcome, is definitely an aspect where we absolutely want to maintain our efforts and energies. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to the panel. Just following on uh, from the Convener's uh, question there, uh, patients arriving at secondary care already on medication, um, and then they're leaving secondary care, going into primary care with medication. Um, as, part, as part of the HEPNA system, will that, will that is, is the thought to, to, to link that up with primary care and into community pharmacy that allows that proper through care, that proper mapping out following uh, the, the, the patient and the medication? Yes, it is, but I think... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you're right, it absolutely is. Again, it's part of that jigsaw. I think there's other... Um, I suppose things that we also have to put in place, the national digital platform will be important in that as well, and a shared medication record. And people are working along those things just now. Mm -hmm. So I think if we have a shared medication record and access to data across those boundaries, that absolutely reduces the harm that medicines can cause. Because we know that across boundaries, when people are discharged or admitted to hospital, that that's where most of some of the, the issues do happen around harm. Mm -hmm. So I think that bit's important as well. The, um, the, the national digital platform, absolutely the, the shared data requirements across that as well. And I think for me, it's also how we uh, look at what we do with patients' medications when they come into hospital. Mm. And I know you've been interested in that area mm. as well, about patients' own medication and how we can utilise and usefully keep patients, I think, very um, integrated with their own care. I think that's important. We see some good examples of health boards doing that. And I think also for me, there's something about how we um, look at the discharge programme where people are coming out of, med out of hospital and secondary care into community and how in some ways we can look at new innovative ways to make that a bit more seamless. 
And I think you've heard some evidence around that as well, about trying to look at um, aspects of using patients' own medication or looking at community pharmacy and discharge and how we join some of that up. So there are definitely some interventions, I think, trying to, to make that a bit of a more smoother, integrated pathway across the piece. Can I just say, just finally, on, on that, we, um, uh, as Rosemary said, um, at, the, at the moment, boards have their own policy mm. about um, the use of patients' own medicine when they're uh, an inpatient and those medicines when they discharge. Uh, and we all, I'm sure, have had examples of, I went into hospital with my own medication, they took them off me, and then when I left, uh, they gave me a brand new prescription, but what happened, etc. Mm. And people perceive that, and understandably so, as waste. Um, not all boards do that. Uh, what boards should be doing is uh, allowing patients to manage their own medication subject to a risk assessment. Uh, and what we are now looking to do is ensure that we have that policy across all our boards mm. so patients are all treated in the same way. Um, of course, whilst you're an inpatient, you may then have additional medication for a short period and so on, but it's trying to make it um, much more uh, around what the patient needs and wants to do and less about different policies between boards. Can I just clarify very quickly? Thank you, Kavina. So, we're talking here about developing a national digital strategy, a national digital uh, uh, platform, if you like. Um, but as you've alluded to there, uh, Cabinet Secretary, each health board has a certain amount of autonomy within, you know, even within the de development of HEPMA and how it, del it delivers HEPMA. So how do we marry up that, that, you know, autonomy with a national digital strategy that should work across the whole country? <coughs> Excuse me. It's a very good question. And what we have to be able to do is to work closely uh, with those who are in the relevant areas in boards so that we uh, manage to create a national approach which also allows for local difference where that the reason for that difference can be evidenced, if that makes sense. So, so some boards will, al almost all boards will have evidence that would say that the, a national approach in their instance, should be followed but tweaked in a particular way across a range of things mm. that I'm sure you and I could both think of. Yeah. Um, so it, it won't work to just create a national policy and impose it, uh, but it doesn't work to have a different approach in every single board. So we, we need to, and we are managing that, for example, even through HR policies. So we now have a suite of single HR policies that are applied in all boards, but were created nationally, involving board HR directors and, importantly, unions. So the, the approach you take to get there is actually the key to how successful you are in delivering it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Emma Hawk. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's just a wee supplementary about HEPMA. Who's ultimately responsible for the rollout of HEPMA? And some of the boards, um, you know, we've had NHS and Fries and Galloway have rolled it out about four years ago. So are they doing it first to kind of test it and f figure out all the problems before it's a wider rollout, rather than each board having it all just imposed on them at the same time? So just a wee clarification on that. If I could maybe just add to that very, very briefly, there are now governance systems, I think, around HEPMA as it now has had more funding and pace and traction. And there are some shared learning aspects to where some boards that have gone early can actually help those bigger boards that are about to go. So there is um, absolutely some shared learning to be um, shared around the, the, um, I suppose the country as well. There is also a governance reporting system from a HEPMA oversight group that then reports an e-pharmacy um, board as well. So there is that governance that then would report to the health and social care management group. So I think f for us it's to get the fact that we can get the, the I suppose the big gains from HEPMA, but also trying to work as much as possible on a once for Scotland basis, even although that's not the right fit, but to try and learn from, I think, what those areas have already already learned from. Like most of these um, electronic prescription type things, it's generally public behaviour that, that is the issue. It's generally how people prescribe and their behaviours. And it's not generally the IT that's the problem. It's generally people and how they're used to prescribing and how they have to change perhaps some of their mindset around that. And are each board, um, do, do some places have a different type of HEPMA system? For instance, we took informal, uh, I guess, feedback after 
one of the sessions that basically said the Glasgow doctors who are training in Dumfries absolutely love HEPMA and can't wait for it to be rolled out in their own place. But will it be the same HEPMA? There certainly is governance around that as well, around um, where boards have to go to business case and final business cases and go to that absolute governance around how they tender for HEPMA systems. And Scotland are very well joined up around that, I think, in learning those lessons across the piece. Because I think we well realised that if you were a junior doctor in Dumfries and then you had to move to another area, it would be really helpful if you had a very, very similar system and were working towards that type of, of cooperation. I think it will also just as a PS to say that... Um, um, boards are doing some things differently, but some things joined up as well. And the north of Scotland are doing a collaboration together of HEPMA, doing that on a much more regional basis. And I think that will give some shared learning as well to the rest of the regions as we go forward. OK. Just I mean, finally, I, I guess December 2020 is good news then, that if that's when we're going to see the rollout of the electronic prescribing, because it's a good safety um, approach to reduce med errors. And I say that as someone who has experience of HEPMA being um, implemented in NHS and Fries and Galloway. So 2020 is, uh, look forward to that. So, so they, and they will all come on at different stages. So for example, NHS Lothian that I said we're partnering with the state hospital uh, will go live this month. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're all at different steps and stages and the end of the year is when we expect to see uh, all uh, bar per perhaps one or two, for Golden Jubilee, I think, are just at a relatively early stage. So uh, they may go into January next year or whatever. OK, thank you. But by this time next year, we could confidently forecast that HEPMA will be up and running. Everywhere. Yes, I think that's yeah. fair. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Fair. George Ed. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'd like to ask about licensing uh, of drugs. Now, specifically, I'll give you some of the background so you know why I'm asking the question. You won't be surprised to know it's regarding multiple sclerosis. And I've been speaking to a neurologist in Glasgow who effectively, and covers Ayrshire as well, who effectively says there are some licensed drugs that are licensed for other conditions that may be used for other uh, MS uh, in some way and might be cheaper than some of the drugs that we currently use. Now, we, during our evidence session, we heard from Dr Scott Jameson of the Royal College of GPs, and he told us, where there's a licensed medicine for an indication, the guidance states that I should use it for that indication. If I do not use it for that indication, I would have to justify on an individual patient-by-patient -patient basis why I preferred not to do so, even if the licensing was not based on uh, efficiency. So, my argument would be, how how can we sort this? Uh, can we sort it? And is this a pharmaceutical manufacturer problem, or is there a better way we can actually do this? Well, I start off, and then maybe Alison wants to come into it. It's a really good point when we have, I suppose, one of the most scrutinised systems uh, looking at medicines governance across the piece. You'll know, obviously, how we do our um, research and development, clinical trials. We've got aspects of how medicines are then licensed. They come to the market. They are marketed with that marketing authority. And then uh, we have our health technology assessment. So there are lots of governance systems, I think, around how we license medicines. Just now, obviously, we're hooked into the European Medicines Agency and MHRA are obviously going to be important going forward and how we license medicines in this country and, and the UK. So that licensed medicines are really important. They generally are for a particular purpose, but it doesn't mean to say that's the only way that drugs can be used. And boards do have policies around how to use medicines that would be off license or off label. And, and they have scrutiny and governance around how that can be done safely. And as we know, clinicians can write prescriptions for those drugs that they wish to do that. And I think what they then have to do is look at the board, the system of governance within the board, which is obviously around their, um, their area drug and therapeutics committee, their formularies, and their system of work and how they sign off either licensed or unlicensed medicines. But Alison, maybe want to add to that? Yes, maybe just to add in that um, I guess there's two types of unlicensed medicines use, and it might be useful just to distinguish between them. So there's one when the medicine genuinely isn't licensed, and there's one when we use it off-label, so it's been licensed for some other purpose. And I think that's what you're reflecting in, in your question. And so we use lots of medicines off-label in that way. Um, most medicines are not tested in children or pregnant women, so it, we use them off-label um, with the best available evidence to make our decisions about how to effectively prescribe them. But it's a really good point you make about 
um, as medicines go through their life cycle, um, sometimes we find that they have additional uses. And thalidomide is a really good example of a medicine which um, we're now using in various cancer treatments for myeloma, although obviously it was originally licensed for a very different purpose. Uh, we've funded a piece of work that um, is being supported by Healthcare Improvement Scotland to test how we might use some of these medicines that are used in an off-label situation and put some governance and structure around that. So we've started looking at cancer medicines because there were a number of cancer medicines that fell into that category. Um, but the learning from that will help us think about how we um, link our kind of policies around that. And as the Cabinet Secretary has reflected, and also Rosemary's talked about, we, we do, health boards are responsible obviously for the kind of governance arrangements for how medicines are used. They do that through area drug and therapeutic committees. Um, and we have an area drug and therapeutic committee collaborative, which actually um, represents all the area drug and therapeutic committees. So we're able to work with them to think about where there's benefits around standardizing processes or having more similar processes applied so that we can actually learn lessons and share best practice in that way. So the work that we're doing around cancer medicines in terms of off-label use, we will um, work through the Area Drug and Therapeutic Committee Collaborative to develop that more widely and to think about how that might apply to other uh, medicines used in that situation. What also occurs to me, um, from what I understood you to say about the evidence that you'd heard, mm -hmm. is that it may be the case that we need to look at how well understood the current governance process is, mm -hmm. um, given that it is possible um, to prescribe a medicine off-label, as uh, both my colleagues have described. If, if we've got clinicians who feel that that is not something they can do, then there, there is a, a gap there in the information and understanding that we are making sure they have. Uh, and the other point I would make is, for, right at the moment, we have uh, scientists testing out existing antiviral medicines to see if they are, will be in any way effective for coronavirus. So it, it, it is not unusual uh, and, and currently in that instance is being actively tested. But our clinicians and our prescribers need to understand uh, what to do. Uh, yes, Cabinet Secretary, that's part of the, the issue is the fact that when you, the health boards in general seem to be very uh, reluctant to actually look at anything that's uh, slightly different or go down that route. And I'm just talking from a very practical day to day and I hear from constituents and everyone else. Uh, now, I always know that we always hear about this wonder drug and it's going to make a difference to everybody's life. And I'm aware of all that. But there, there, if there is an easier way to do this, surely there must be a way. And I take on board what you're saying with regards to health boards. But up until now, they don't actually seem to be kind of proactively looking at this kind of thing. I, I'm not sure that, that I would think that was entirely fair. And I think one of the things we need to uh, remember is that um, much of the governance around the prescribing of drugs is there for very good reason. And some of it has arisen because of very serious instances of abuse that have harmed patients quite significantly. So we, and I know you are, we need to be really mindful about what what is uh, appropriate governance to ensure that we are learning lessons from when things did, went wrong uh, and what is governance that is keeping patients safe and where might there be one or two layers that are not critical to either of those two uh, objectives. Um, and so I think what is fair for us to say is that through the network and the committees that Alison has just described is that, you know, I'm quite happy to undertake to look and see, to ask uh, that national group to look at whether or not there are any ways that we could do two things. Could we uh, streamline uh, that in any respect? And most definitely, can we ensure that all prescribing clinicians understand what the current route now is and what they have to do, so they're not forbidden, mm -hmm. what they have to do in order to prescribe off-label, as it is described. Thank you. And, and is there anything that could be done to encourage pharmaceutical manufacturers to apply for licence for a, 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 an alternative or an additional purpose? And if so, who should be doing it? Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question as well. And I think we, we do do that in many circumstances. I think we would encourage the pharmaceutical industry to be innovative and also, I think, to come back in um, if they have to look at licensing or have to look at our health technology assessment or to be reassessed for perhaps an extension of their license or so. So I think we can encourage that. Um, and I think generally some of our innovation can certainly encourage that. I think we're coming to a new era of much more um, precision medicine, much more stratified across the population, and I think these areas will be really important. And we see some medicines being repurposed, older medicines now being used for very different things, so there's something there about perhaps that huge, um, I, I suppose, burden in some pharmaceutical industry to get a medicines to licensing. It's very costly, it takes some time. Some of those areas might be able to be shortened a bit, and that might help. Good. Yes. Add in um, that there are some challenges, I think, particularly in the area where it might be a medicine that's a very old medicine and it's now a, what we call a generic medicine, so it's manufactured by different companies and they are less likely probably to be able to um, put a medicine through a clinical trial process in, in order to get the data to allow it to be licensed for a new purpose. And so there is something about understanding what levers there might be to support, I think, as Rosemary said, the repurposing in that situation. But, but it, it's not, these are not insurmountable difficulties. No. I, I think it's fair to say they're not insurmountable, just some of them are more challenging than others. OK, thank you very much. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, Camille, and good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary and, and panel also. If I could just expand slightly on what the previous ones about licence uh, medicine and, and talk about trade negotiations in respect to, obviously, we've got Brexit uh, and others as well. Uh, we heard from the representative from the UK Department of Health and Social Care about the potential for trade negotiations uh, to affect the price of medicines. He assured us, or sorry, the representative assured us that there was no intention to have prices sort of a, on the table as such. But there were other uh, people who gave evidence, and they suggested they may indirectly be affected by increasing patent lengths. I think you were mentioned that, Alison. Uh, so I, I would like to ask, um, has the Scottish Government analysed the potential effect of increased prices from US pharmaceutical companies, and perhaps Brexit even comes into this particular aspect as well, would it have in Scotland, uh, for example, would be more likely to sort of reduce the access to medicines or increase the prescribing budget, or perhaps both of these? So... I think in terms, I'm going to ask my colleagues to come in on what would be particularly important for us in terms of any trade deal around mm. medicines, any deal around medicines about certain standards and so on. But I, I think um, at, at this point, uh, it is a, in one sense too early to be able to answer your question definitively. Um, what and of course, it's it's my colleague, Mr. Russell, who is much more actively engaged in the discussions with the UK government around any um, negotiating position on any trade deal with whomever that might be. And in that, um, uh, we we are making clear to him across a number of a number of areas, mm -hmm. not a, a, you know not everything, but what is important to us in terms of. Uh, standards of um, governance, of patient safety, uh, of regulation that we want to see replicated. And we are also, of course, in contact uh, with colleagues uh, uh, at Westminster uh, and in the UK government around the Medicines and Medical Devices uh, Bill, which has just, I think, has just entered uh, the UK Parliament for consideration, which looks at what would be uh, our replacement to the current European system uh, that we have been part of. So at this point, it, it is very difficult to judge whether any potential trade deal with any particular other country would have a serious cost implication for us. Um, medicines is a huge part of what we spend our NHS budget on, um, and we keep striving to get best value for money and uh, to follow some of the Montgomery uh, recommendations indeed in that regard about uh, wh what our role is in discussions with pharmaceutical companies and so on on, on that side of uh, things. Uh, but it's at this stage, it's much more about what are the, what are the 
key red lines, if you like, mm -hmm. for us as Scottish government about anything that is that involves negotiation around a trade deal that involves drugs. I mean, I maybe just start off with then maybe Alison wants to talk about the, the more recent um, bill. So I think, I suppose, just for me, it's to say that it is quite complicated for us because lots of the powers we have around medicines are, are not devolved. And I think that does in some way, I suppose, it say where we are at this point in time. We all know that there's both generic and branded medicines and that the company that obviously has the branded medicine holds that patent um, for a number of years. So that's important. I think that the pharmaceutical industry has that research and development and bringing that to the market. And, and for us also, the regulation of pricing and supply of medicines and medical supplies are reserved to the UK government, along with the licensing or marketing authority of drugs. And also the human medicines regulations are reserved and the health service medical supplies are reserved. So, so, and we know that controlled drugs regulation are reserved as well. So although we have good relationships with our Department of Health and Social Care colleagues and MHRA who are important in all of these areas, we are in some ways um, party to that um, devolved administration feeding into the whole kind of cross UK aspect of it. So it is quite complicated. There are so many uh, levers I think that we can have and there's others that we can't. But I think coming back to EU exit and the, the recent bill, it might be helpful if Alison wants to outline a, a couple of those pointers. Yes, so um, Rosemary's touched on the issue around licensing. And, and actually, I think one of the key concerns we would have in the first instance is around what happens um, post the transition period when we come into the 1st of January next year and how our processes deal with the licensing of medicines and therefore their availability um, across the UK. So uh, we're, we're working very closely with our colleagues in the Department of Health and Social Care and also the Medicines, Healthcare and Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA, to ensure that... Um, that we remain as an attractive country for companies to come and launch their products in. Um, if the kind of um, current s situation is that normally a, a company will launch in America first, then they'll come to Europe, then they go to Japan, and then they, they kind of launch in other countries, which they kind of call, call third country launch. I think what's really important for us is that the UK remains at the top end of that and we're attractive to companies to come and, and work um, and launch their products and make them available for patients so that we can get the best possible outcomes. So that's a big piece of work for us. And alongside that, we are also thinking about um, the sort of trade negotiations and then analysing and looking around risks and benefits around aspects of that. But to touch on the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill, that's just been... Um, uh, put forward in, in the UK um, uh, Parliament to not actually introduce new legislation at this moment in time, but to introduce the levers to allow us to look at new legislation around licensing um, and thinking about also how we um, can uh, look at some of the areas around particularly precision medicine and some of the new advanced therapies and how we make those available um, in hospitals and in, in communities where it's appropriate to do so to patients. So there is quite a big piece of work that will happen from now going forward. Um, so I think possibly in terms of what the committee can do that's helpful is, is to make sure that, um, I, I suppose, we encourage our colleagues across the UK to be working together so that, in fact, we're, we're thinking about you know, health technology assessment in Scotland as well as um, what they may do in, in um, England and, and Wales and other parts of the country. So I think that would be something that would be useful to allow us to, to work in a way that means that the SMC get access to medicines that are newly licensed as quickly as possible so that you can make decisions around their availability across um, in health boards. Can I have a quick... Very briefly. I'm going to be follow up. You should either nod yes or, or, or no. Uh, I would hope then that, to, for clarification, that the Scottish Government and yourselves are involved in talks along this new piece of legislation because it's really very, very important. So you can either go like that or go like that. Can the official report? So a yes would be good. <laughs> so, so at official level, yes. Um, and in terms of how we feed that through, uh, at a political level, that is through Mr Russell. Um, and, and there is a real importance to it because mm -hmm. colleagues will be very well aware of the significant advances and support that advances in precision medicine in Scotland that is being led by um, not only our academic institutions but others actively engaged in Scotland. We have real possibilities here uh, for particular reasons of our um, data storage and the protection around that storage, our size, um, the capacity of our uh, universities to cooperate very well together and I do not want 
the NHS in Scotland and therefore patients in Scotland to lose the gains that will come from that significant work that's underway. Um, um, so what uh, Alison is saying about making sure that we stay at the top, if you like, of that launch league table is really important. Thank you very and, much. And, and, and a simple yes, no on this one. I take it then we should expect an LCM, a legislative consent motion, in relation to the bill just introduced. Uh, in a, yes, in as much as there may be some aspects of it that uh, are appropriate for here. Yeah, yes. if, if it is the case. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. David Stewart. <coughs> uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to Cabinet Secretary and the panel. Could I move on to pricing? and ask the Cabinet Secretary specifically what assessment that she has made of the effectiveness of the current model of pricing in terms of encouraging innovation in the sector. So, by that, do you mean the role of, of the uh, SMC in this? Or? Yes, and, and particularly the, um, uh, the use of the VPAS, the branded drugs uh -huh. price regulation scheme. Yeah. <clears throat> so... Um, I think that the, the VPAS scheme, thank you very much for finding it for me, um, the VPAS scheme, which I know you're aware of, uh, helps us, has helped us considerably since we, uh, it was introduced in 2019. And um, because the, um, the spending above the cap is paid back uh, to the health service, that allows us then to use that in terms of support for access to new medicines. Uh, whether or not there is more that we can do with that, I don't know if Alison wants to say a bit more, uh, having been quite directly involved in uh, the way we looked to uh, work uh, with Vertex uh, to see if there were other ways uh, to introduce new medicines in anticipation of what we've just talked about, which is the impact of precision medicine, where we will start to see uh, medicines developed and introduced are much more targeted on smaller cohorts of patients and therefore might fall outside the current approach that we take. So at a very simple level, um, what the more we spend on medicines as a result of the VPAS arrangement, once we go over the cap, the more money we get back from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, we expect it to be around about £93 million in Scotland during 2019, and that money we have reinvested back into the NHS, um, and it's gone to uh, support the New Medicines Fund, which is used for both um, access to medicines that are approved by SMC, but also for medicines that come through the PAX Tier 1 or 2 process uh, for medicines that haven't been approved for routine use. Um, Two of the kind of key factors in the VPAS um, negotiation, which were very important to us from a Scottish perspective, were about achieving greater transparency on pricing so that we could make sure that if one part of the country was agreeing a price on a medicine, that was shared with the other parts of the country so that we could equally have a conversation to ensure we achieve that same price. Um, and also an ability for companies to proactively come and... Um, and work with us to achieve those kind of comparable pricing arrangements. So they have been two really important levers for us in terms of helping deliver some of the recommendations from Dr. M Brian Montgomery's review on access to new medicines mm -hmm. around achieving um, better pricing. One of the challenges, and we've talked a little bit about this before, and Rosemary's talked about the reserved versus devolved nature. So pricing the regulation of pricing of medicines is a reserved area, so we have limits around how much flexibility we have around that. But the VPAS arrangement has allowed us to introduce greater flexibilities um, to help us ensure that we do get and achieve the best value for Scotland. Mm. And if, through your community, you've touched on um, my final question, which is really about how the rest of the UK operates. I understand the reserved nature of this, but do you have a, do you have a team in the Scottish Government that actually monitors prices and products in Northern Ireland, Wales and England? We work very closely with NHS National Procurement, who actually are our kind of uh, body that are responsible for obviously looking at procurement issues. So between our team in medicines and pharmacy um, division plus national procurement colleagues, yes, we work very closely and we have. And we're in the middle of setting up um, arrangements which will allow that information sharing between um, the different organisations involved in pricing and negotiations on price so that we actually have sight of the prices and we can therefore mm. enter into negotiations around. Uh, and uh, finally, do you, I mean, could you give us an example then, say for example, England or Wales um, has, ha has a better arrangement on a drug than Scotland. Would you pick up that best practice within Scotland? 
we would certainly work to do that. And, um, and Cabinet Secretaries talked about the work we did around um, cystic fibrosis medicines. Um, we worked collectively across the UK to achieve comparable arrangements um, so that we're all um, getting the same value back in terms of um, how, how that's, how that's uh, delivered in terms of um, pricing. I guess the thing to think about in all of this is sometimes there might be different um, parameters attached with some of the deals. So in England, there's a cancer drugs fund where data is collected. Now, you know, we would want to think about whether we would want to do exactly the same thing or whether we would want to adjust that. And we have those flexibilities to allow us to think about what would work best in a Scottish situation mm. and how do we support our clinicians in being able to collect mm. that data and feedback. So you've, you've, you've obviously left it open for me to say, do we need a cancer drugs fund in Scotland? No, I don't think we need a cancer drugs fund in Scotland. We sure. create our own problems. <laughs> Very brief. Yes, Rosemary. I think it is a really important position where we are in Scotland and one of the meetings we're going to just after this actually is about talking about the voluntary scheme ambitions. So we are talking to our Department of Health and Social Care colleagues and some of those ambitions are absolutely about encouraging horizon planning, engagement with, with companies obviously and bringing people into the market, looking at transparency of prices and also as they are looking at the nice arrangements for health technology assessment. And if I'm, being, if I'm being kind, I think sometimes nice because of its size um, is also sometimes overwhelm some of those discussions. And we have to remind all of the time our colleagues in Department of Health that SMC is very important as well. Our health technology assessment is internationally renowned. It's well, it's well thought of. But we also have some different systems. Like the, the new medicines fund is different in Scotland. We put all of that VPAS money back into medicines, and other other systems don't. So we, we absolutely have to keep reminding. I think mm. those systems on a UK basis that Scotland is here and important. Okay, thank you. Uh, David Torrance. Convener, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary and panel members. The committee's heard evidence about the inequality of scrutiny in medicines compared to other healthcare interventions. Cabinet Secretary, do you think there should be a similar? Um, sort of scrutiny for other healthcare interventions and is there any way you're going to address this? So <clears throat> can I just check that, that what you um, if what you are referring to is the the degree of uh, robust scrutiny and clinical trial that goes into medicines yes. compared to perhaps medical devices? Yes. Right. Um, so uh, so MHRA is the, is the UK body, um, as we've already said, and that covers medical devices. Um, and uh, we have certainly, as government, raised concerns with MHRA, which we continue to pursue, about the, the robustness of uh, their assessment and uh, testing process when it comes to medical devices, as opposed to what we require, quite rightly, uh, for medicines, uh, and our argument is essentially it, it has crystallised around the use of mesh uh, in surgical procedures, uh, and essentially it is that, that what is put inside a person's body, uh, be it a device or be it uh, a pill, is equally important, and therefore we want uh, and continue to press MHRA to look at the process that they use for medical devices to make it comparable to the process all of us uh, expect for the clinical trials and the licensing and so on of medicines. Now, uh, we have raised that directly, our chief medical officer has raised it directly, and we continue to pursue that with them. And I have no doubt it will be, although the medical uh, medicines and medical devices bill at Westminster that we've touched on has a particular purpose, but I'm no doubt that markers will be laid down in that discussion and debate as it goes through its various stages to try and improve on that whole process from MHRI. Thank you. Um, the committee has heard reviews of non-medical prescriptions do not take place comprehensively or routinely, and GPs do not believe that they are best placed to do this. What is your view on this, Cabinet Secretary? So. I'm happy to maybe take that on. And actually, almost just as, as you were talking there about scrutiny around medicines versus devices, I, I think it's a new field in some ways for MHRA, and I think we continue to press them. 
uh, an antibiotic resistance is a good example of that, where we have developed an antibiotic app where people can, can learn and share from that information, but that has to be um, compliant again with MHRA and, and that type of governance system as well. So I think healthcare professionals are going to see things quite differently in the future, and I think your systems and regulation need to, I think, hopefully um, come up to that. But, but maybe just going back to your, your aspect about prescribing and repeat prescribing across the piece, I think we're also entering a new area around how we do and how we treat um, people who are prescribed medicines. As we, you have said, we've got more prescribers, non-medical prescribers. That could be pharmacists or nurses or EHPs, others. So more people are able to prescribe in their area of competence. But I think what we also need within the system when we're building that is looking at medication review so that people aren't just prescribed a medicine, they are absolutely routinely um, monitored to see that that medicine's not causing harm. And if other medicines are, are obviously added into that, that that's taken account of. You, you will know, you've maybe heard it from other evidence as well, that we are growing a new service within GP practice around pharmacotherapy where um, pharmacists and pharmacy technicians and some support staff are being added to a GP practice to help their governance around medicines prescribing and repeat, particularly repeat medicines prescribing. And, and I think bringing some sense to that for, for some areas of, of work so that that chronic medication and that, that review is done so that people, again, are able to get the best from their medicines without um, getting uh, hopefully too much harm from that. And I think what we can see, because it's an ambition under achieving excellence um, in pharmaceutical care, is that we have, as part of the GP contract, grown that field or that, that level that up to 70% of our GP practices now have pharmacists and technicians doing that, I suppose, immediate look, level one, kind of lower level look at prescribing and repeat prescribing. We have ambitions to allow that um, competency to increase, to allow pharmacists and their staff and others and non-medical prescribers to look at what happens if, um, if we have to review medicines. Can we actually de-prescribe? Can we look at patients who need that medication review, target them? Can we look at our polypharmacy guidance and make sure that that's been applied across the piece? So I think for us, we're entering a new area of prescribing that may be, I think, much more about the individual and having that individual review would be important to that as well. Okay. Brief supplementary, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, we heard evidence about the cost of the medicines budget has increased, but it's not just medicines, it's things like the freestyle Libra for diabetes, you know. But I, my, I guess my simple question is, how are we measuring whether the impact of the introduction of diabetes tech, which has an upfront cost, how are we measuring that to reduce um, hospital admissions due to type 2 complications, for instance, because we heard the evidence that says about £500 million a year is being spent mitigating type 2 complications. But if we're introducing diabetes tech, that costs a lot of money up front, obviously that is an improvement in glycemic control to mitigate um, admissions in the first place. And, and what you've just said makes absolutely perfect sense. The, the the difficulty in making those very clear measurements takes us right back to almost the first question that the convener asked, which is about data collection, because you need to get robust data collection across all your levels of healthcare in order to make those kind of comparisons. And I think it is fair to say that across the country, we are, we are not at that point. Now, we are in some parts, for example, Fife ran a major uh, piece of pilot work around how it worked, not in that particular uh, instance that you're describing, but how it, it worked with type 2 diabetes uh, in terms of how it worked in primary care and what that then uh, produced by way of admissions uh, into a reduction in admissions uh, into secondary care. Uh, but that is very uh, confined data. Um, so the, the Scottish-wide approach is not where we are at this point. I don't know if... Rosemary Allison, what to say anymore? I think it is a really good question. It's almost what can we do upstream to stop some of the issues downstream as well? And for some of the areas around the device you mentioned, it is about obviously patients and how they feel about their disease and how they have that choice, I think, and how they measure blood sugar. And in a different scheme under the cancer um, programme outcomes arrangement, we are looking at um, patient reported outcomes. 
so patients are able to report quite quickly what they feel about their medicine if they've just been given an infusion, for instance, or if they're at home and they don't feel well. And I think patient reported outcomes done by IT and an app coming into a central place will be important. So these types of generic approaches, I think, might be important to understand what difference that makes to a patient's life. So it isn't always about cost effectiveness, it might also be about acceptability and in essence hopefully it, would, it may also stop some aspects of admissions or, or patients being more in control of their own disease state. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add, there's a very wise pharmacy academic from America who once came here and challenged us that in the UK we worry a lot about the costs of medicines and not always enough about the consequences of medicines. And I think sometimes that can be extrapolated um, to think about we focus a lot on medicines as but not the whole kind of pathway. And I think what you were describing there was that kind of treatment pathway approach and how medicines or medical devices or new technologies you know, come together. But as the Cabinet Secretary said, I think key to that will be our ability to, to capture some of that data and be able to, to attribute it appropriately. But that certainly is what we're trying to do with the developments around the national digital platform mm -hmm. and trying to link that together. So there was a question earlier on about how we'll make sure all of this aligns. The, our um, HEPMA oversight group is chaired, uh, co-chaired by one of the clinical advisors to the National Digital Platform Service. So we've got that link up straight away and we're thinking about how, what data can come from HEPMA, what data then kind of locks into the National Digital, digital Platform. So it's a bit like a plug and play and how we bring the primary care data in and other things. So I, I think, you know, we definitely have the building blocks there. And I think the size of Scotland means that we should be able to get some, some traction around, um, uh, you know, establishing that and rolling that out quite quickly. Yeah. We'll probably want to focus in on some areas initially to, mm -hmm. to gain that experience and then think about how we spread. I should probably mention that I am one of the users of the Abbott Libra in order to be transparent. So I am one of those digital users. So. Noted. Um, <laughs> the, uh, very briefly, the New Medicines Fund you've mentioned a couple of times, is that providing the funding required to cover uh, uh, rare and, and uh, end-of-life condition medicines used by boards? Uh, and if not, is that uh, covered beyond the funding in the NMF? So, uh, as you know, convener, we, we have a commitment which uh, we continue to honour that the, uh, the money that returns to us from VPAS, we will put in full into the New Medicines Fund uh, for the reasons that uh, Alison outlined before. Um, <clears throat> my, my suspicion is that that fund will never be big enough, uh, in truth, uh, because uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies will continue to bring forward new medicines uh, that people want to be able to access. Um, there is a requirement, I think, for us to look as precision medicine develops and we understand better with SMC who are uh, actively looking at what it might mean for their <coughs> decision-making processes and, and what they look for, uh, for us with them and, and others to look at what we then expect that to do in terms of uh, medicines coming onto the market, uh, how we use what was talked about earlier in terms of um, negotiation around price uh, and discussions and sharing with pharmaceutical companies and colleagues elsewhere in the UK, and what that then means for us in terms of how we look at funding for medicines across our NHS. Um, but at this point, uh, we have those. I think the New Medicines Fund is vitally important, but we need to, um, in the same way as we uh, know that SMC are looking at their processes in anticipation of precision medicine and other um, innovations coming forward. We need to parallel that by looking at, well, how do we fund all of this? And are there any uh, <coughs> ways by which we should alter that in the light of what are innovative but very important patient developments? Okay, thank you very much. Brian. <coughs> and thank you, Kibina. Um, you mentioned in your opening statement, Cabinet Secretary, around sort of non-medical interventions and how uh, they should become they should become more important. We've discussed this this many times. I think there's, there's great agreement across the board that uh, that's the direction of travel that, that, that we need to go in. But we still have a system that, uh, as, as default, seems to medicalise problems when other interventions perhaps 
would give better outcomes. So I think given that we are in agreement uh, that, that social prescribing is, is something we want to integrate more into, a, into our medical system, I think the question really is how do we practically do that on a national basis? I'm going to say a couple of things and then I know <coughs> Rosemary wants to add to it. Um, so I think we already have some examples mm. of where um, parts of our system uh, are using social prescribing alongside uh, medical intervention very effectively. And um, you've heard from me before the East, East Kilbride example yeah, yeah. on hypertension, uh, but we have other examples. I think there are two um, uh, opportunities to move this forward. One is that pharmacotherapy service uh, that Rosemary talked about, uh, because again, we, we are seeing evidence that when that pharmacist or uh, pharmacist technician has the conversation with the patient who is on uh, many medi medicines uh, about uh, which ones feel effective to the patients, which one that pink pill you've had it's for the last two years, is it making a difference? No, it's not making any difference. And we try, okay, well, let's stop using it for a couple of months and see, and you can always go back on it. All of those mm -hmm. conversations, there's an important part of those conversations in that people are finding it easier to be honest with the pharmacist about whether long-term medicines have been prescribed are working for them than they do with the doctor who prescribed them. Um, and if you think about the psychology of that, it makes sense. So what we are then seeing is the opportunity of the pharmacist to be introducing through discussions with the GP other areas of um, so what we would call social prescribing more activity or uh, being part of a lunch club or whatever it might be. It's, it's mm. more than activity, as you and I have discussed. Mm. And the other opportunity for us to use are community link workers um, in terms of making sure that there are known about in a, in a particular GP practice, be it the pharmacist or be it the GPs or whoever, the advanced uh, nurse practitioner, the practice nurse, uh, what are all the opportunities in that community? Where are the book clubs? Where are the walking the walking football? Uh, where where are the walking groups or the lunch clubs or whatever it might be that people can be pointed towards uh, and help to join? Now, what we need to do is try, and this is not straightforward. Um, we're back to a bit where you and I were in an earlier conversation. How do we nationally? pull that together in a way that doesn't dampen the important local initiatives that are vital to this. How do we do that so that people are aware of all the options? And then what more can we do to encourage our prescribers, whether they're pharmacists or whether they're GPs, to look at the evidence of this and to know what is possible in their own community for their own patient cohort? And those are the two areas that my colleague uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, as you know, is giving some more significant thought to about, we can't keep talking about the value of social prescribing, no. and as you've said many times, uh, <laughs> or just dealing in examples. We need to find a way for us to actively promote it in a way that is practicable for those who are the prescribers in the first place. <clears throat> Excuse me, absolutely, and I think just to add to that, on our kind of medicines theme as well, I'm sure if our deputy CMO was here, he would also then want to speak about realistic medicines and that shared decision-making where the prescriber and the patient come together to make those decision-making. So, yes, I may not take this medicine that you that you tell me about and I'm not doing it because of X, Y or Z. But So I think patients and people understanding and valuing medicines is a, a big piece of how we actually look at prescribing and reducing the harm. And for me, I think we have examples of where that can work. And antibiotic or micro, antimicrobial resistance is one area where people can understand that they actually don't want to overuse antibiotics. It may be a viral illness, but they also have a need for a prescription and, and feel they have a need for a prescription. How can we lower that need? How can we have education training around that? And, and we have seen interventions around antibiotics that has worked. And over the course of the last number of years, certainly a, a real decrease, maybe more than 10% decrease in antibiotic prescribing. So I think there's a mindset of a pill for every ill that 
it perhaps is there in society that we must try, I think, and push back a bit. Lifestyle interventions are difficult and writing a prescription can be easy. So there's something there about how those choices are taken forward. Okay, so I think, uh, thank you for that. I, th I think what I would say, can I say, you say point them in the right direction, I would say lead them in the right direction. <laughs> there's, a, there's a slight difference in nuance there. I think uh, the, 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 in, in terms of the question, what I was really getting at was, we need we need a healthcare system that that is carrying that local community information uh, and and can access that 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 those sort of local assets easily, which is probably where we come back to this national data framework that, that you're, you're putting together a national platform that you're putting together sort of, sort of community program at a national level for want of a better expression, and it's it's I think the question really is how do we get to the point where a GP surgery or a pharmacist or an EHP or whatever it is, because we all know great examples of these. How do we get to a point where they have the they have the opportunity to have the conversation with the patient, to understand their interests, to be able to then marry that up with what's available in the local community? And in essence, if we're going to be successful, that's what we have to do. Easy and as difficult as that is. And uh, and I completely agree with you. That is what we have to do. And. Um, it sounds, it can sound straightforward, and it's not. Mm -hmm. So there are there are practical steps to be taken, some of which we've touched on, mm -hmm. about um, having uh, that national drive, which still allows for uh, local initiatives and doesn't kill them off, if you like, mm -hmm. by insisting that it has to look the same everywhere. Um, but there, but there is a, another aspect to that, and that is about mindset. Um, it's partly what Rosemary just referred to, is how, what more do we need to do to move all of us away from thinking that what I will get from going to my GP practice or my pharmacist is, uh, is a, a bottle of tablets or an injection into expecting that if I don't get that, that's, that's still me being treated, right? So shifting our mindsets mm. to... Um, see social prescribing as valuable alongside the prescription of medicines, e at least equal in value. Mm. And that is sometimes it's a combination, sometimes it's just one. And the other side is the mindset of the prescribers. Now, um, part of that is what we get from the GP contract, the phase one of the GP contract, with that introduction of the multidisciplinary team, partly designed to, to give the GP more time to have those conversations, but also introducing that pharmacotherapy service, which assists. And the GPs have a means by which they can have those conversations with you or me or anyone called anticipatory care planning. Um, now, uh, a lot of GP practices do it. Arguably, they, they wait until we're old before they do it, whereas actually anticipatory care planning can be the opportunity to have a conversation with any patient about what matters to you. So we have this in, in hospitals, as you know, the whole what matters to you approach. That, that's what it looks like in the GP practice. And uh, I'm sure in previous occasions, the committee will have heard from Carrie Lunan of the Royal College of General Practitioners, um, a huge advocate for anticipatory care planning did a lot of work to roll that out for us across GP practices, whom we have been speaking to again about how can we refresh that mm. so that the anticipatory care planning is seen as an opportunity to have conversations, particularly with patients with more than one condition, about uh, their care, so that it is shared decision-making and into which you can feed what you and I would describe as social prescribing, as well as... Yeah, and so, um, so I just maybe comment and picking up on what Cabinet Secretary said there. So um, as part of um, a medicines review for people with multiple morbidities, or if they're coming and they're presenting with multiple morbidities, we have a, a seven step process that we've introduced. And the first step of that is what matters to you. And that really asks the GP and the patient to discuss what's important to them. And can they address it through lifestyle? So before initiating a prescription, a GP or a non-medical prescriber is having that conversation with the patient. So it picks up on what could I do? What could, what could I do rather than taking a tablet? 
and alongside that there's some shared patient decision tools that are pictorial so that patients can be really part of that conversation in making and weighing up the benefit of a medicine because actually maybe the medicine might do them more harm than good. So we do have that in place that's been agreed by clinicians from uh, medical nursing and pharmacy background across primary and secondary care to start having that conversation. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Convener and good afternoon to the panel. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions with regards to the pharmacy contract um, and specifically what plans the government have to change uh, the contract to create more incentives to drive um, better pharmaceutical care and whether or not any consideration had been given or in the benefit of negotiating both the GP contract and pharmacy contract or in the same time. Yeah, I, I can start off and maybe Brian would want to come in on the back of some of that as well. Um, you, you may or may not be aware we, um, we do negotiate the community pharmacy contract on an annual basis and this year we, we've managed to actually have some stability to the, to the area and Cabinet Secretary has, I, I think, rightly so, been able to pr progress a three-year deal looking forward. And, and generally, without going into the, the detail of it, because we don't have enough time, um, it's quite a complicated contract in many ways. I think it's not where we would start if we had a blank sheet of paper. However, there are um, caveats, I think, of where we're trying to progress to. Achieving excellence definitely gives that policy perspective where we want community pharmacists to play a wider range of patient-focused interventions. Coming away really from supply dispensing, not completely, but perhaps looking at other ways to do that and be much more upfront with the patient, talking about their medicines and trying to reduce some of that harm that it can, ha can happen with there as well. A couple of streams to that. One will be about introducing Pharmacy First, which will allow pharmacists to treat patients quite differently across the piece. So our, our population of Scotland will be eligible to go in to talk to a pharmacist to talk about their care or perhaps their symptom that may be um, hopefully um, limiting symptom, but be able to get some advice. First advice, secondly self-care, and then potentially treatment or referral. And that will be a very different way of working and we've got a, a model of remuneration that also has changed on the back of that as well. So pharmacy first is important in doing that. A mindset change, I think, for pharmacists as well. And they have, I, I think, because they've done quite a lot of um, work around that in the last few months, have embraced that challenge. Um, I think it's a much more satisfying job to use the skills and competency you have to talk to a patient about their medicines rather than perhaps do some of the dispensing and supply work around that. The other area that we want to push for is also looking at long-term conditions. And I think we, we have refreshed the um, medicines care and review aspect. And for me, that's the key to allow pharmacists and their staff to again look at some of that serial and repeat prescribing that could come from a GP practice absolutely into um, primary care. And I think that's the right place to be about medicines because they are the people that are able to hopefully um, refer and do those uh, medication reviews in a better way. And we have actually then have to turn our model of remuneration around so that we've um, put it really crudely, trying to take the focus away from getting drug margin along their drug tariff and putting more money and, and mapping money into services. So a more guaranteed global sum that will allow us to pay for pharmacy first, allow us to pay for a more enhanced aspect of um, a medicines care and review so that pharmacists can be doing things that we think they kind of should be doing. But mm -hmm. Brian might... I think I, I can't really add any more to what Rosemary said. I think that, that we are changing the way that we contract with community pharmacies and the services that deliver, and it is about shifting that um, model away for, from, re from reimbursement from mm -hmm. the dispensing of medicines to actually remunerating for the pharmaceutical care that they deliver. And that's where chronic medication service and the new NHS Pharmacy for Scotland service will be key in that. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns which have been put to the committee throughout our inquiry is they've been their own workforce, though, and some of the destabilisation which we've seen. Now, I visited a pharmacy quite recently where um, the lack of locums here in Lothian meant that the pharmacist, she was finding it difficult to uh, plan to attend her own wedding. So what sort of work is being undertaken around future-proofing workforce, given that we're seeing um, often professionals moving from community pharmacy um, into NHS and GP settings, and what sort of uh, assessments been made of the workforce uh, survey which took place last year as well? Um, well, the workforce challenges are not exclusive 
um, to, to community pharmacy. I think we, we, we know that there were workforce challenges across the NHS in, 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 in its entirety. Um, as part of the three-year agreement we have entered with Community Pharmacy Scotland is we are looking to put in a new um, independent prescribing career pathway as well as a foundation programme, um, which is about encouraging um, people to come back into community pharmacy to practice so they will be able to use and maximise their skills that they have. So not only the, 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 the pa patient interaction, but also they get to maximise on their, their medicine knowledge um, and provide patients with that long term treatment. Um, so that, 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 that's a, a real key change um, in terms of um, what we're looking to do with community pharmacy in terms of bringing people into the network and to keep it sustained. But I think there's a bit of being able to acknowledge those people who are currently in community pharmacies and delivering, um, the, the, um, whether that be independent prescribing clinics or, or, or walk-in clinics for common clinical conditions. So again, there is recognition within that three-year deal which has recently been agreed that we will look to reward and incentivize to, to, to encourage contractors to um, offer better conditions that can be more comparable with, with, with what is offered with other areas of the health care system. Uh, briefly, please, Rosemary. And I think on workforce generally, I think we understand that pharmacists and the utilisation of pharmacists is growing and we have um, <coughs> put more places and money into a pre-registration training and trying to talk to our schools of pharmacy or uh, Scottish Funding Council about increasing the places across schools of pharmacy as well. Because I think you're right, we haven't quite got the models right across the piece. I think we need to look at automation, we need to skill mix, so it's maybe a technician or it may be an assistant doing some of these jobs that we, that we maybe have done 10 years ago I would have perhaps done myself there's something there about how we get that skill mix right and flexible working I think is one of the other areas that workforce can can help because we see pharmacists want to work across the piece they might want to have a few days in community pharmacy to have that patient contact but maybe another few days in uh, working in a GP practice to look at that prescribing aspect so I think we need to be flexible in going forward and and that will be quite new to us I think as well Thank you very much. Um, I know the Scottish Government is working on a single national formulary, but some of the evidence we heard was that that should be in addition to rather than in place of the local formularies that currently exist. Is that also the Government's view? And if so, how does, uh, how does the best practice from different formularies uh, get rolled across or, or brought into the uh, domain of a single national formulary? Um, so we are very much growing our work towards um, implementing a single national formulary based on um, bottom up. So we're working um, through area drug and therapeutic committees in individual boards because the most important thing is that clinicians themselves have some ownership over over the, the actual formula it itself and that way we have better adherence to prescribing in it. So um, we've started to do some work in Lothian um, to test a platform that we've built and to actually look at those processes around local engagement and think about how we move to regional convergence and then um, to a national uh, system. And it links really nicely in with the work that we're doing around hospital electronic prescribing as well, because in the same way that we heard about the North region working collectively to implement HEPMA, one of the key things for the success of that will be having um, a sort of standard drug dictionary that, that people are using. Um, but I think importantly, um, I think for me, the piece around the formula is, is around thinking about how medicines sit within the treatment care pathways. So there is a need for us to continue to make sure, as the Cabinet Secretary's further uh, mentioned today, I think, that where there needs to be flexibility, that there is that flexibility. So, you know, we've got that kind of way of um, having a national solution, but where some things need to work more um, around the local system, that there's still that flexibility to do that. And I think focusing in on clinical um, pathways is, is the key way to doing that and where the medicine sits within that pathway. And that probably allows us to think a little bit about the social um, prescribing aspects as well as the medicines. Okay, thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you. A couple of questions about online pharmacies and online prescribing. Um, in our briefing papers, I mean, and we've taken evidence about concerns uh, of, or an impact on community pharmacies with the advent of online pharmacies. And uh, it, in our briefing, it says entry into the community pharmacy market and the ability to dispense NHS prescriptions is controlled by each NHS board. And I'm just interested to know what 
impact you think online pharmacies will have on our community pharmacy network? Because we've heard evidence that we want our community pharmacies to to help support medicines and medicine prescribing. Uh, maybe. So, oh, sorry. So uh, I would absolutely be very concerned if there was a significant impact on our community pharmacy. I think everything we've heard this morning, and particularly the launch of Pharmacy First, uh, is a, a major and exciting development, and it is all linked to that shifting the balance of care. Um, so uh, Rosemary may say briefly a bit more about this, but we would have some concern if we were seeing significant evidence of impact on community pharmacy by online Absolutely, I would agree. I think there is a place for online things, but in some ways medicines are not that type of commodity. And I think what we have to see in all of that is that we want pharmacists to be there to talk about advice and treatment and, and individualising that medication as well. So for our pharmacy first service, there's a principle that we would say we don't expect this to be um, given on an online way at all. We want the pharmacist to be there to treat. And I think there's something important about our community pharmacy network, those 1,257 um, pharmacies across, across Scotland that has got that social capital as well as not just about medicines. You will see that many patients visit their community pharmacy. Uh, pharmacists see lots of patients across the, across the week for many different reasons. But there is something there about the high street pharmacy that people are able to access, whether that's about public health, whether it's needle exchange or methadone. That social capital is really important as well. And that needs a physical presence. I mean, I know it's probably a question for another day, but there's online GPs that are now out there as well, and that is an additional concern that's probably worth exploring down the line. But I, I, with the advent of online pharmacies, is there is there a, a way that we should be controlling entry into the pharmaceutical list anymore? I mean, how, how do we see that competition or that market work? I mean, Could just be... The Sorry, Brian, I was going to like, just say there also is a regulator um, across the GB that was, yes, has is. got, um, I think, their eye on online um, pharmacies and how they could potentially be abused and how potentially they can actually be regulated under that way. So there are some regulatory issues, but sorry, sorry, I cut you off. Uh, <clears throat> I was just going to say, but in terms of within the, 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 the Scottish dimension, um, obviously to provide pharmaceutical care, um, in Scotland, you have to apply to an individual health board to be added to their pharmaceutical list. And w with that, there has to be a, 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 a consultation taking place between all the, the parties, the community, the board and the applicant. And it's about there being a need and a desire. And within there is the actual point of the services that they're going to. So it's not just about the, the dispensing of a medicine. It's about the actual care that they're providing and the pharmacy services that they're pro providing to that community. So the, 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 the rise of online pharmacies are somewhat mitigated. Um, but it is an area, and as Rosemary has mentioned, that the regulator will, will, will look at to, to make sure that, the, that there is that safety aspect. Okay. And I'll go on to just a Questions about waste. Is that, um, we've heard a lot about medicine waste and how, how we need to try and mitigate it. And some of the, the information that we got was extrapolated from English uh, in, in information. But uh, I'm interested to know what can we do to improve our understanding of where waste occurs and then how do we, uh, how do we then uh, uh, tackle that? So, um, briefly... Rosemary, do yeah, you want I mean, to as Kevin, the Secretary said in her opening remarks, ju just really briefly, not all waste is avoidable, avoidable. There are some areas where prescribing is absolutely there, and then, and then I think sometimes that medicine is no longer used. We certainly do have um, systems to uh, try and reduce waste as much as possible. I just very briefly to talk about care homes, where you have maybe heard about some of that aspects of um, overprescribing or so-called overprescribing in care homes, and how do we mitigate some of that? You hopefully have had some evidence from NHS Tayside that has got some, I think, working with the care homes inspectorate, really good protocols to try and reduce that medicine's waste. And it actually has happened, I think, in Tayside that they've managed to do that through protocol-driven governance. And I think what we would want to do is to make sure that all other health boards adopt that type of approach as well. So for me, uh, waste is not an easy subject. Um, I think it could possibly go on for another hour or so, but there's something there about how we look at we how we prescribe effectively, how we have those effective guidelines in place, and we can actually bring down uh, prescribing numbers, but we also, I think, can have aspects to try and reduce waste. 
Thank you very much. And uh, I don't think there is uh, an appetite for another hour on uh, medicines waste, although it is certainly an important topic. And we may come back to you with uh, further queries as we compile a report. But can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the officials very much for your evidence this morning? Uh, and we will now uh, briefly suspend and then move on to the next thank item. You. Thank you very much. To item number two on the agenda, which is the uh, consideration of the NHS superannuation and pension schemes, miscellaneous amendments, Scotland regulations 2020, which colleagues will be aware is simply an operating uh, uh, to account for inflation in the uh, level of funding here. Uh, do members have any comments on these regulations? Yes, please. Uh, Annex E. Uh, basically, under the consultation, uh, an empty consultation, NHS employees, employers, Scottish Government and UK Government departments, and there was no responses received to the consultation at all. It might be a good thing, but I just wanted to point that part out. And then in Annex B on the same subject, in page 8, under consultation again, I just wonder if we get an update on this particular bit. I uh, went to maybe the third sentence. It is noted that the structure to apply for member contribution is still under active discussion amongst the Scottish Ministers, the Advisory Board and Her Majesty's Treasury regarding the outcomes, etc., etc. And then it goes on to say whether the proposals are likely to achieve the required yield of 9.8% of pay over the period of April 2020, which is just next month, to March 2021, was required by Her Majesty's Treasury then it goes on to say is expected to be around 0.1% below the or two below the required yield of 9.8%. So, so there's an uncertainty there. I don't just ask you for any comments. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to delay. It's obviously a, a rise, etc. And there's mm. a lot of people who are losing out if they don't get that. But they've not came to an agreement yet, and it's only next month. Is that anything we can ask for? Clarification, or is that going to delay it for a while? No consultation, and then this doesn't seem. Or am I reading it wrongly? <laughs> you know, I mean, my my initial response would be that I do, I, I don't think these. I mean, these matters are presumably under constant negotiation, and I'm not aware that there's any substantive impact. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm checking with tax and that's I just I just wanted well, to so. point it out that. It's next month and there's no agreement reached. Yeah. But I don't want to delay it. But it's just, just been a wee bit of a pest, you know. Just <laughs> you do it so well. I know I do. Far, 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 be it, far be it for me to reach that conclusion. <laughs> uh, but um, having noted the comments that right, Sandra White you. has made, um, <laughs> are we agreed to make no recommendations on this measure? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. And the third item on the agenda is the Public Health Scotland Act 2008 Notifiable Diseases and Notifiable Organisms Amendment Regulations 2020. Um, the Delegated Powers and uh, Law Reform Committee have noted that this was laid um, uh, and, became, and came into effect immediately the following day. This is, of course, uh, in relation to coronavirus. Uh, and therefore, while drawing it, our attention to this fact, uh, they made no uh, recommendation on that basis, uh, having uh, concluded that that was a perfectly reasonable uh, situation uh, in, for, for the government to act as, as it did. Um, can I ask if members have any comments on this uh, instrument? Nope. If not, uh, are we agreed to make no recommendations on this instrument? Thank you very much, colleagues. We'll now move briefly into private session um, for uh, agenda item number three.